Starship Flight 9 was a mix of breakthrough achievements and hard-learned lessons. It marked SpaceX's strong comeback after two consecutive failures, became the first mission to refly a super heavy booster, and gave us our first real glimpse at what the next Gen Block 2 Starships are capable of. But alongside the winds, the flight also highlighted lingering issues in system robustness and vehicle architecture. In this breakdown, we'll walk through each critical phase of Flight 9, what went right, what went wrong, and what it all means for the future of the Starship program. Starship Flight 9, featuring Ship 35 mounted atop Booster 14, lifted off from Launch Pad A at Starbase on Tuesday evening, kicking off an ambitious suborbital test flight aimed at validating key design upgrades and mission objectives. The sight of the rocket clearing the launch pad was nothing short of surreal, with all engines performing nominally during the liftoff and ascent phases. This launch was historic, as Booster 14 became the first super heavy booster to be reflown, having previously supported Flight 7 in January. SpaceX refurbished the booster by replacing single-use components while retaining most of its flight-proven structures and subsystems. Notably, 29 of its 33 Raptor engines were reused from the earlier mission. The rocket's ascent proceeded smoothly, with the vehicle passing through maximum aerodynamic pressure approximately 62 seconds after liftoff. The thermal protection system tiles on the ship withstood the aerodynamic stresses without significant loss, indicating improvements in TPS durability. Approximately 2 minutes and 35 seconds into the flight, the booster's outer engines shut down as planned, leaving the center three engines active. Ship 35 then ignited its six engines, executing a successful stage separation. The separation procedures executed improvised maneuvers compared to the previous test flights. In earlier flights, the booster flipped in a randomized direction driven by slight thrust imbalances during upper stage ignition. This time, however, the flip was controlled, achieved by blocking specific vents on the hot stage adapter, which redirected exhaust to push the booster in a known direction. This precise maneuver reduces the ship's need for reserve propellant, freeing up more for ascent, and enabling higher payload capacity in future missions. Following the flip, the booster reignited its inner ring of 10 engines for the boost back burn. This phase had previously encountered issues in flights 7 and 8 due to pre-burner igniter failures, caused by excessive thermal stress from extreme temperatures near the ignition zone. These conditions can damage sensitive components or alter propellant behavior, leading to unreliable ignition. SpaceX addressed these concerns by enhancing insulation around the igniters, leading to a successful boost back burn in Flight 9. After completing the boost back burn, the booster jettisoned the hot stage ring to reduce mass during descent. SpaceX planned several experimental maneuvers during the booster's return to gather real-world performance data on advanced flight profiles and off-nominal scenarios. You minimize risk to ground infrastructure during these high-risk experiments. No mid-air recovery was attempted. Instead, the booster followed a downrange trajectory over the Gulf of America for a controlled ocean splashdown. One of the key experiments involved guiding the booster down at a steeper angle of attack to increase atmospheric drag, thereby slowing its descent through aerodynamic braking. This method conserved fuel, enhanced landing accuracy, and yielded valuable data for refining Super Heavy's flight control algorithms. Among the pre-planned objectives was testing engine-out scenarios during the landing burn, designed to have backup engines automatically take over thrust control if a failure occurred, a vital feature intended to ensure the booster could still land safely even if an engine failed seconds before the tower catch. However, during the landing burn, things began to deviate from the plan. One of the 13 center engines failed to restart, and telemetry data soon confirmed that all engines had shut down moments later. The booster was approximately 20 seconds from landing when the anomaly occurred, resulting in its loss. Despite the setback, the flawless operation of a reused booster through stage separation, providing the critical thrust to propel the ship into space, was a remarkable achievement. According to SpaceX, insights gained from refurbishing this booster, combined with pre-launch testing, and in-flight data from Flight 9 will contribute to SpaceX's goal of achieving rapid turnaround times for booster reusability. Did you see a confirmation that the booster did demise? So the booster's flight ending before it was able to get through landing burn, but again, we are not bringing that back. We are expecting it to make a hard splashdown in the Gulf. We are getting live data back the entire time through that high angle of attack flight, so that was something that was really vital for us to get during this reuse. After separation, Ship 35 continued its ascent along the planned trajectory. All attention was focused on whether it would complete the ascent burn successfully and reach the Seco or second engine cutoff point as planned. 
In the past two missions, structural and propulsion issues, like fuel line ruptures from unexpected harmonic vibrations, and propellant leaks that caused ignition of propellants outside the combustion chamber, led to engine failures and prevented the ship from completing its ascent burn. To address these problems, SpaceX implemented several design upgrades on Ship 35, including reinforced propellant feed lines, optimized temperature management, revised engine thrust profiles, increased preload on critical joints, added venting systems, installed a gaseous nitrogen purge, and improved propellant drain architecture. They also ran extensive long-duration Raptor firings at McGregor and static fire tests at Starbase to replicate issues and validate the fixes. Thanks to hardware upgrades and extensive ground testing, Flight 9's ascent was smooth, most notably free of destructive harmonic vibrations, and closely tracked the intended trajectory, as evident in this comparison video. However, approximately nine minutes into the mission, a localized spot on a vacuum Raptor nozzle began glowing red hot, signaling severe thermal stress. This issue mirrored a similar problem from Flight 8, where a red-hot area on the nozzle preceded a catastrophic engine bay explosion that damaged nearby engines and led to the vehicle's total loss. In Flight 9, though, this anomaly appeared near the end of the ascent burn, and the affected engine shut down seconds after the glow was detected, effectively preventing the problem from escalating. Though this incident signals engine reliability issues still exist, SpaceX has clearly made progress this time. All engines completed the full ascent burn without failing, a major improvement over last two flight tests. After the RVAC engine shut down, the sea level Raptors cut off as planned, completing the full ascent burn. This marked the first time a Block 2 Starship cleared the seacoast stage, or second engine cutoff, a major milestone for SpaceX and the Starship program. The ship continued coasting along the intended suborbital trajectory, ultimately targeting a controlled splashdown in the Indian Ocean. However, things began to go off track during the coast phase. The planned deployment of eight Starlink mass simulators couldn't take place due to a payload bay door issue that prevented it from opening. These simulators, built to replicate the size and mass of the upcoming Starlink Gen 3 satellites, were meant to validate Starship's payload deployment system. But that critical test had to be skipped due to the anomaly. The ship continued its journey thereafter, but soon began losing attitude control and started spinning in space. The root cause was traced to a propellant leak, which led to a loss of main tank pressure critical for feeding the reaction control system thrusters. We did spring a leak in some of the fuel tank systems inside of Starship, which a lot of those are used for your attitude control. And so at this point, we've essentially lost our attitude control with Starship. These thrusters rely on high pressure ullage gas flow to generate precise control torques needed for stable orientation in the vacuum of space. With tank pressure dropping below operational thresholds, the RCS thrusters lost effectiveness, causing the ship to lose fine attitude control and begin uncontrolled spinning. This failure compromised the spacecraft's ability to execute planned maneuvers and maintain proper orientation. SpaceX had planned a brief five-second Raptor engine firing during the coast phase to demonstrate microgravity restart capability, an essential maneuver for accurate re-entry and landing in future flights. However, this test was abarted due to the loss of attitude control. The loss of attitude control led to an uncontrolled re-entry, leaving the vehicle's heat shield tiles not oriented towards the plasma flow. This misalignment exposed unprotected surfaces to intense thermal and mechanical stresses. Several heat tile experiments, including tests of new metallic tiles with active cooling, were planned during re-entry, but could not be conducted effectively due to the vehicle's orientation. Recognizing the inability to perform a controlled re-entry, SpaceX initiated an automated safing process to vent remaining propellants, placing the vehicle in the safest possible condition. At this point, we had lost attitude control of the ship and entered into a spin. The team made the call to do what's called passivate the vehicle, so we're essentially venting all of the remaining propellant overboard, and it's going to make an uncontrolled re-entry. As Ship 35 descended into denser atmospheric layers, it began to tumble and disintegrate due to plasma breaches and structural failures. Contact with the ship was eventually lost about 46 minutes into the flight, and SpaceX confirmed the vehicle was lost, with all debris expected to fall within the designated hazard zone in the Indian Ocean. And just to confirm, we did lose contact with the ship officially a couple of minutes ago, so that brings an end to the ninth flight test. And we clear the zones in the Indian Ocean where these entries could take place. Um, so we're not going to come down exactly where we would have had nothing happened, uh, but we do clear a 
tremendous amount of uh, space out in the Indian Ocean um, in the event that we run into this. You always, we, we understand that there are always risks, essentially with these flight tests, with the hardware, uh, but we don't really accept any compromise when it comes to protecting people. SpaceX is currently analyzing data to determine the exact causes of the booster landing burn anomaly and the propellant leak in Ship 35. The Federal Aviation Administration has acknowledged the incident and is collaborating with SpaceX on the investigation. No injuries or damage to public property have been reported. Despite the setbacks, Flight 9 marked important milestones, most notably, the successful reflight of a super-heavy booster and the first full-duration ascent burn by a Block 2 Starship. These achievements provided SpaceX with critical data for future mission planning and restored confidence in the Starship program, which had been shaken by two consecutive failures. It remains unclear whether SpaceX will repeat the same suborbital flight plan next time, given that many Flight 9 objectives went unmet, or push forward with an orbital mission that includes mid-air recovery of the ship using the tower arms. Elon Musk has announced plans to ramp up the launch cadence, targeting a flight every three to four weeks. The upcoming three flights will use ships 36 through 38, with ship 38 serving as the final Block 2 vehicle. Starting with ship 39, SpaceX will transition to the next generation Block 3 starships. This makes the next three flight tests critical. They must thoroughly test, identify, and resolve all design issues in the Block 2 ships before moving on to Block 3. Preparations for the upcoming missions are in full swing. Ship 36 has received all its Raptor engines and is now being prepped for static fire tests. Ship 37 is fully stacked inside Mega Bay 2, getting ready for its cryo-proof testing. Meanwhile, Ship 38 stacking is complete. The final aft section was added just days ago, and work on its electrical, hydraulic, and avionic systems is currently underway. Let's stay optimistic that SpaceX will quickly pinpoint the root causes behind Flight 9's anomalies, apply effective fixes to the upcoming ships and boosters, and get Starship flying again within a month, just as Musk promised. We'll be diving deeper into the Flight 9 details and tracking the progress of upcoming missions as more information becomes available. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell to stay updated with all the latest developments.